vital security layer to protect confidentiality and integrity is cryptography. It includes several approaches to hiding data or ensuring its authenticity. In this first lesson of the cryptography series, I explore the history of cryptography and how it has changed over the centuries. You can download the script for this video from the link above or at the end of the video. Cryptography is often considered a science. It's the science of determining secure ways of protecting the confidentiality and integrity of information by making it unreadable to anyone not authorized to access it. Today, cryptography is accomplished via the mathematical manipulation of data. But this hasn't always been the case. Now let's get some definitions in. Plain text is information in a form anyone can read. Ciphertext is information that has been made unreadable by cryptography. Encryption is the process of converting plain text to ciphertext. Decryption converts ciphertext to plain text. And finally, cryptanalysis is the science of cracking approaches to encryption. Codebreakers are related to cryptanalysts, but they attempt to crack codes instead of encryption. Cryptography began centuries ago as a way to hide secret information critical to waging battles and wars. Leaders needed a way to protect information about the enemy, missions, and other sensitive information that were sent with messengers in a way that enemy forces could not read. Many contend that the first encryption was Egyptian hieroglyphics as long as 4,000 years ago. However, the Egyptians didn't use hieroglyph hieroglyphics for cryptography. It was more of an art form used to communicate history and other information. The first use of cryptography for hiding data was likely used by the Spartans circa 400 BCE. Their approach is known as a skittily cipher. The cipher would wrap a piece of leather or cloth around a peg or stick and write the message. The recipient needed to wrap the message around a stick of precisely the same shape and size to read the message. Eventually, everyone caught on and found it pretty easy to figure out the messages. The Caesar cipher, used by Julius Caesar, went a step further. It uses what is known as a substitution cipher. The sender would shift the standard alphabet used a certain number of characters. In this example, we shift three. The sender then replaced the message characters with replacements in the same positions in the cryptographic alphabet. The recipient needs to know the shift number and shift direction to decode the message. A message encrypted with the Caesar cipher shifted as in this slide would look like this. The Caesar cipher worked well for Caesar since most people couldn't even read at the time. This monoalphabetic substitution cipher became unusable after early cryptanalysts discovered how to easily crack a simple substitution shift cipher. The three big problems with them lie in patterns. Each language has its own patterns of usage that help figure out what words might appear in certain locations. For example, Using DEF might easily be AND or THE when used it in English. FG or TU is likely to be TO or AT. Another pattern weakness is the frequency and patterns of letter usage. For example, the letter E is the most used letter in English at about 11%, along with those shown. Finally, letters tend to associate with other letters. For example, the shown letter doublings are common in English. In addition, letter pairings like these are also common. Understanding these patterns, cracking monoalphabetic substitution ciphers is pretty easy. In the 16th century, Vignier developed a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. While a monoalphabetic cipher, like the Caesar cipher, uses just one alphabet, Venier's cipher uses 27. This helped disable simple letter frequency and pairing analysis. The Venier cipher is based on a Venier table. The table is created by beginning the first row with a shifted alphabet associated with the letter A. In this case, it's shifted one place. 
Each subsequent row is shifted an additional place until the letter Z is reached in the left column. To encrypt a message, the sender selects a key. In this example, the keyword is fringe. The key is repeated over the message with all spaces removed, as shown. To encrypt the letter G in the plain text, the sender goes down the left column to locate F, the corresponding key letter. She then moves across the associated alphabet until reaching the G column. The letter at this intersection of row and column is the replacement character, in this case M. Continuing this process, the resulting ciphertext is as shown. If the same table is always used, the sender and receiver only have to know the key. The first break of the Venier cipher was published in 1863 by Friedrich Kosinski, although the approach was likely used by Charles Babbage as early as 1846. Because of the repetitions of the key and of word patterns or phrases in text, Babbage was able to identify repeated segments in the ciphertext. Once repetitions are identified, the characters between repetitions are determined, and the number of possible key lengths is significantly reduced, making identifying the key length possible. If a cryptanalyst can determine the length of the key, the ciphertext can be handled like a set of Caesar's, Caesar ciphers. Each set can be easily broken. Short messages are much harder to crack than long messages due to the possible lack of repeating sequences. The examples so far have shown that cryptanalysts work hard to break encryption methods. This has driven continuous improvements in cryptography that eventually fall given cryptanalyst efforts and increasing processor speeds. Cryptography methods that have fallen over the years include rotocipher machines that mechanically encrypt messages. The most famous of these is the German Enigma machine, and the use of it was broken by a group of Polish cryptanalysts. To better understand how Enigma worked, go to the link shown. Mary Queen of Scots and her minions used a codebook. I describe codebooks later in this video. And one of the first modern encryption algorithms, DES, was used for years to encrypt electronic information, but it has long been considered unsafe. Codebooks contain words and phrases cross-referenced with words, phrases, or symbols that replace them. One-time pads are unbreakable but require keys as long as the plain text. Each sheet in the pad is a key and is only used once. One-time pads are considered uncrackable. Let's look at some examples. This is the code that was used by Mary Queen of Scots. It was easily cracked. Note that replacements are coded for entire words and letters. This is a coded message using the code. This is a much more complex codebook that was used for more modern military coding. Note the increased size. The use of reasonably secure codebooks is very time-consuming. Further, theft of the codebook, which is distributed to all who need it, makes a codebook obsolete. A one-time pad is a physical pad or an electronic algorithm that uses a random key as long as the plain text. A single sheet of a physical pad contains the key. The recipient simply needs to know which pad and which pad page was used for encryption to decrypt the message. This is an example of an NSA physical pad sheet. The description of how a one-time pad works varies by source. A simple replacement of the plain text message is done by using complementary letters on the pad sheet in situations where a physical pad is used. In other examples, modular math is used to extract a value from the key and plain text pairing. This example shows a one-time pad electronic approach that XORs the plain text stream with the key stream value. Using an online text to binary converter, I converted the plain text attack at dawn and the key into binary values shown. The next step is to XOR the two values. 
XOR is a Boolean operation that results in a 1 if the inputs are not all the same. This results in the cipher stream shown, which is entirely safe if the key is truly random and is the same length as the plain text. That's it for the history of cryptography. It was a brief look at a very rich history of how militaries, governments, and now organizations try to protect their data. In the remaining videos in this series, I explore modern approaches to encryption and how they apply to secure protocols. I also look at attacks against each type. Hashing is not really encryption, but I included it because it's a close cousin needed to fill gaps not always served by encryption. Well, that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.